Okay. I thought I'd take a minute, if we could, not as speakers, but as an audience. What we and I know listening to nine presentations is a lot. Imagine the last day when we listened to eighteen. Eighteen and four hours. Right? Eighteen and four hours. How many minutes do you get each? Like ten. Oh yeah. Ten. <laughs> so a, as an audience, what what do you get as you watch look, watch you watch the various presentations? Um, and do you remember them at all? It's not specifics, but what works, what doesn't work. So I think if you could think of it from the audience's perspective, that will make it even better for you as a speaker next time. You have to kind of really choose what you want to express. Okay. Well, is that, so is that to say, I mean, I know you want uh, quality of applying, but is that to say that, uh, and you can't really cover them, uh, so is that to say that you really don't want a very, you know, in-depth project, or, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, you can barely say anything. Right. Um, what's our, what's our whole presentation kind of, are we really able to hold it together as part of what we're doing? Well, we, it's going to be a little bit weird. So the, the goal here is to have three presentations, get some points across in presentation one and presentation two, which provides the background for presentation three so you can get right to your point and dive into the point of presentation three. The challenge there is that half the room will not have heard presentations one and two. They just need to give a little bit one or two slides. So like when we're in this one, you, you gave your SWOT analysis yeah. and you talked about strengths and you talked about and threats. You don't need to give the whole analysis. You know, you can bring up a SWOT slide and just say the only thing that matters here is the opportunity more than the threat. Talk about what really, really is the crux of the situation. So the audience will at least understand the company for the most part. Any other thoughts on it? I thought. Oh, sorry. There's like a lot of things hard to remember. So if there's uh, maybe like a word, something strong that you can then it'll be a lot of things. Keep it. Keep keep the, the slides simple. Yeah. And you have you could talk about it around it, but the slides should be as simple as possible. I break that rule when I present here because I want to have detailed slides. I want you all to have those slides as study guides. Um, but really, even as a, as a professor, you should have very simple slides that get it across. I, I break that rule. There was one team, and I even made a comment to them, that used a little bit of humor. And I thought that was good. Know your audience. Could you talk to a bunch of CEOs? Maybe not. But in a classroom, setting, it'll engage. You want to engage. There were a few individuals who um, read. You can't read. Only because if you're reading, there's, you can't put the energy into your message. You have to kind of create excitement in how you talk. So really avoid reading. And it was across a few teams. Any, anything else that people saw? Go to the intro too. So we're done with the first one. We have the midterm next week, and then our second interim deliverable on the on the calendar starts the week right after. Now we're not going to do nine in a day anymore, and I'm hoping you don't have a lot of other things assigned. If you have in the last in the in the course of April, do you have a lot of deliverables for your other teams, your other um, classes? What's that? We have at least one exam every week. Okay. What I was hoping to do was um, starting with the 18th, have three teams a week with 10 minute presentations. So three on the 18th, three on the 25th, and three on the um, on May 2nd. 
I kind of even assigned the teams to the week a little bit based upon what I know we're going to talk about in the second half of the semester and knowing which teams maybe could use some of that information as they refine their theses. Um, May 2nd. And then May 9th is our combined final presentation. Are you all okay with those three? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you which teams I said go where, and we can have some negotiation. It's okay. It's not like set in stone. Um, so on the 18th, I had Boeing, Polo, and S. On the 25th, I had CBS, Starwoods, and Whole Foods. And on the 2nd, I had Amex, Goldman, and Merck. Any teams really not want the week they got? Okay. Um, I, I will say it again. I'll say it again, okay? You know I'll even write it down. So, um, and you guys are 25th. Anybody else want Would anybody, anybody who has been assigned the 18th, two weeks, would you like to switch to the 25th? Push it back. Wow. Well, I thought everyone would want to. I think everyone wants <laughs> so how, how bad is it? So there's three teams on the week of the 20th. How bad is it for you guys on that week? There's an exam on that day. Do <laughs> <laughs> you want me to switch to the 18th and the second and leave the 25th? No presentation. Pick out four and five. Yeah. And audiences, you're okay with that as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll do that then. What's that? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Who on the 25th wants to move back to the second? <laughs> Yes, it's one. Two. Is it one spin? Is that 
Okay. CBS is number one, Star Wars is two, and Whole Foods is three. You're my um the other back of the team. Random integer. One comma three. Okay, CBS gets their choice first. What do you want? Okay, CBS is moved to the 18th. Okay, Whole Foods gets their choice second. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, I would. Sorry. Okay, so we have the midterm next week. Just so I can think about today a little bit. How many of you have done a good number of the homework problems? I have gotten emails to maybe go over two of them, and so from time to end, I will go over them. And if not, I'll go over them. Um, the midterm will be, you have the one side of one page, Arial 12, trip sheet, whatever you want to put on, you know that. Um, it will be half multiple choice, half open-ended. I'm, I'm deciding it might be as many, we have a lot of time, so I'm not going to have class after it, so you have to take a breath. It might be a great opportunity to pick, stick with both teams going on 418 to get together and work on the project. It's one that can support if you have a long breakout session to work on the project. Um, so we have multiple choice, half open ended. Uh, probably 25 to 30 multiple choice. We have a lot of time. And I don't have any open ended yet. Some of these are just the end. So there's just so many diverse topics. There will definitely be the opportunity not to answer all of them. I don't know if six to eight or not that far. Six out of ten? Four out of ten.
questions on the midterm? finished here, we talked about how master budgets are driven by strategy and short-term objectives, and then master budgets start with a sound budget, and then other budgets come out of it, we have operating budgets and financial budgets and ultimately cash budgets. That happens generally once a year, although we could have year-round rolling budgets as well. They're based upon standards and costs. A master budget leads to something that we'll talk about in chapters 14 and 15 today called flexible budget. Where a master budget is forward looking, a flexible budget is backwards looking and allows you to see how you've done versus your master budget and break it down into detail to understand um, what has been working and what hasn't been working. And ultimately, from the flexible budget, you do something called variance analysis. So today is really about taking what's called master budget to variance analysis. And in fact, chapter 16 also includes some variance analysis. That's the um, that's the day. Let's complete our discussion of the master budget. Remember, at the beginning of the period, it's often conservatively a two-month process to come up with a budget. It's top that top down, bottom up, the organization working together to come up with budgets that are achievable yet aggressive. That um, the members of the organization can grab a hold of and say, let's go for it. And the, the idea is to get the organization centered on what they're going to do in this next period, year, month, whatever it's going to be. So a master budget drives you forward. Tells you what you can do and what you can't do. And the master budget itself is driven by the sales budget. This example is mainly in a manufacturing, it, it, it is a manufacturing example, um, but it's really similar in all examples, in all companies, except you only have to get both of the material. Um, so the sales budget drives the master budgeting process. How much are we going to sell next year? So you need to forecast sales volume number of sales, and prices. How much can we sell it for? In my experience, so this sales budgeting happens primarily in revenue systems, re revenue um, departments, revenue centers. We'll talk about that later in the set. Those are centers where they're responsible for the sales. Um, senior management is what I want to make these numbers as big as they can get away with. And the people who are responsible for the sales, since they're going to be held accountable for their sales budgets, want to make it attainable. And there's a lot of give and take as they come up with the correct answer. But 
but ultimately, you have a forecast bill, uh, and usually that forecast is monthly. You have, have short-term targets um, that we need to go long term annually. So using the example of the text, Terry Industries, and they're just showing for the next three periods the amount of sales they're expecting. And then therefore the quarter we sell is some of those three. They expect to sell at the same price in all three months. Meaning for total sales. This is the result of whatever negotiating process went on with the budgeting cycle. Okay. Um, let me do this one. This will be so fast. Okay, Craft Bakery introduced a new line of apple pie. They expect sales were, or well, 2010 sales by quarter were. 11, 16, 15, maybe 20,000. They expect that they're going to increase their sales 25% in their respective quarter. And then what is what the expected sales in units and dollars? Pretty basic. So if it was quarter one, uh, quarter quarter one in 2011, 25 percent higher than the previous quarter one. You want to, if you haven't already done it, just do it for quarters two and three. Sales in units and dollars. Quarter is sales in units. So after you have your sales budget, and it, you know, after you have your sales budget, you then can create your production budget. How much you need to produce? And that's driven by sales. Your production budget is your budgeted sales plus how much inventory you want to have at the end, minus the amount of inventory you have at the beginning. Quite often, the desired ending inventory is represented as a percentage of the following month's expected sales. So, if you expect to sell 20,000 units next month, and you want to have 20% of that in inventory at the beginning of the month, then your, your desired ending inventory would be 4,000 units as your ending inventory. So 
in our example, the carry example, beginning inventory in April was 5,000 units. The desired ending inventory is 30% of May's projected sales. And if we go back to our slide here, in May we project, projected to sell 25,000 units. So we have 20,000 that we expect to sell in April, plus 20, plus 30% of 25,000 units, minus starting in the very beginning of April. So production in April will need to be 25. So now we know how many units of goods of a product we need to produce going forward. Now once you know the units, the next step is to figure out the resources that need to go into making those units. Direct materials, direct labor, and indirect. Materials and think of that just as you would the sales of producers and a purchases. Well, I'm sorry, there are two different budgets here the usage budget and a purchases budget. How much direct material are you going to use in that period and how much direct material you need to purchase in that period? They're not always the same. Probably more. Um, yeah, let's let's go through it. It's a little bit hairy. Let's look at the purchases budget first. They kind of you, know, you don't do one before the other. You do one, it adds information to the other. They kind of go back and forth to each other. Um, so the purchases budget contains the amount of purchases in, in direct material sold in units and dollars. We need the purchases budget figure out the usage budget, because from the purchases you'll know the cost. So you've actually gone ahead and thought of, or planned, planned you don't know what your planned cost is going to be. The purchases budget is a function of how much material is required for production. You know, we did three pounds of aluminum for every item we be building, or whatever. What your target in the inventory for material will be. And that's based upon what your um, beginning or what your next month's needs are going to be, what you already have in those in materials, and then what you're budgeting as your purchase price. It's a lot to see on the slide. How many of you have this printed out in front of you? If anybody wants one of these, I have extra. I made it not for you. But it's on, if you have your slides, you might be able to see it. You have to, this interacts with, this is the usage budget, and it interacts with the purchases budget, back and forth. So it might be useful to have a usage budget in front of you. I added it, not, not that, it wasn't in the slides back, so I didn't probably. I added it after the slides. I didn't want to be challenged. But it is on if you print it again. Okay, so let's start with the usage budget. That hopefully some of you have in front of you. It starts with the production requirements, which, which we've already figured out. In this case, it's three pounds of aluminum for one unit of product. So you have to have a standard, standard cost. Standard usage is three pounds per product. The to 
total pounds of aluminum you'll need in production to produce the number of units you want to produce is just the extension of those two numbers. The cost of the materials now. First, we have the pounds of aluminum from the beginning inventory. That's given based upon our production schedule and the three, um, three units per. The cost per pound. your estimate based upon platform. Notice it's different per period. And we're doing it FIFO based period. So therefore your total cost of your beginning inventory, total cost of your beginning inventory is the extension of the amount you have times the cost of that beginning inventory. Somehow, I'm going to the total cost of the aluminum purchases comes from the next, comes from the purchases budget. The way you calculate that. How much? How many units you need to produce the goods that you want to produce? So I believe in April we're producing 22.5, and you need three per. So I got that number. Plus, you know you need some units for the inventory you want to end with. This tells you how much direct materials you need in total minus whatever you had in inventory from the last period. So you know you need to purchase 68,900 units. What you need for production, what you need for inventory, minus what you already have in inventory. That's the total number of units. This is the purchase price per pound during the month of April. Remember we had $2.40. Here, because of the previous month, the ending price. So our total cost for our purchases in April will be 168805 Did you ever ask us for the beginning of average cost? No, I may not even ever ask you for this. <laughs> Don't stop listening, because I might. <laughs> <laughs> So the total cost of your aluminum is the value of your beginning plus the value of what you're buying in that period. You track out what you're going to have in inventory at the end. Leaving you 165.25 as the cost of the aluminum you're using this period. This cost is some weighting between the cost of the aluminum you bought this period, at, at the, the, the cost per unit is the weighting between the cost you bought this period and the cost of the aluminum you had in inventory already. That's why this won't, if you divide this by the number of units, it won't equal either 240 or 245, it should be somewhere in between, close to 245. So why the cost per unit for the quarter is 2.6? Because from the purchase budget, we don't know the purchase unit. Sure. I'm just 
Yes. Why would they not know the causes? So just the unit, but in the life for the causes. There's no perfect track so far. Or because but it's some kind of a weighting, but you're adding up each individual. This is the cost at the end of the quarter, but the total amount that you spend per quarter is a weighting for how much you spend each of the months, which would be a weighting between these two values. So how do you get 2.6 in falling flat? This 2.6? No, less. Is it a cover? Cost per unit? This is the desired end inventory. So at the end of the quarter, when you have an inventory, yeah. the FIFO method yeah. is 2.6. But the last units you have were bought at 2.6. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So you can see how these two schedules, the um, usage schedule and the purchases schedule, interact. Okay, direct labor, we're not going to, a little bit more straightforward. You need, to, you need to understand your direct labor budget to understand planned hirings and firings, or as you like to call it, repositioning. And it's prepared by each class of labor, and it's a function of, again, it's all a function of sales. Sales leads to production, production leads to what resources you need to produce. And it's based on standard labor hours per unit of output. And standard wage rates. Okay, so Terry, same example, uses half an hour of <coughs> semi skilled labor and two tenths of an hour of skilled labor per unit. And their, uh, their semi skilled labor gets $8 an hour, but their skilled labor gets $12. Pretty good. Minimum wage now? And so this, this is fairly straightforward. It's broken by semi-skilled and skilled. You know the number of units. You know the price. You figure out the dollar amount for labor. Semi-skilled. I had the same thing for skilled. And then this is your total direct labor. Overhead. We'll be talking a lot about um, overhead later today. Variable overhead and fixed overhead. Um, it could be activity based. It could be volume based. Here it's based on direct labor hours. The variable side. The amount of overhead based on that. Fixed is just given. This is not about allocating fixed products. It's just about budgeting going forward how much you expect to have. So you have a schedule of your overhead. And from here, you could um, now drive your remaining budgets. So you know your costs, both direct and overhead. You know your sales. You can figure out the cost of goods sold. Um, you add in um, administrative and management uh, and selling expenses, central office expenses. Additionally, on budgeting, you, you have a cash receipt budgeting. Remember, cash is is, is king. You need to make sure you have enough cash in your plans in order to pay off your, your debt, your, your debts. Is the cash 
Yeah, if it, you, you drive, this is how you drive your performance. So from this, you'll be able to have your income statements and payment of cash flows and your balance sheets. And when you do your cash budgeting, you're looking at your cash flow from operations. Hopefully that's a positive number. The cash that you need for capital investments and cash that you might need for financing. And so you see your cash flow. In the case of Terry, they're not making, they're not buying any equipment and they don't have any financing. And then you budget your income statement and your balance sheet. So you can create pro forma, pro forma looking forward. <laughs> okay, so you've done all this hard work, and what's the likelihood you're going to hit it head on? Zero, uh, not zero. <laughs> approaching zero. The target. So you, you know, quite often you'll do analyses during the budgeting process to understand what if you don't quite get there. What if sales are 10% less than you're estimating? But you're, you know, you're, you're, you're growing in a certain way to get to that sales level. What, ha what happens if your costs are increasing more than sales so you're going to run out of cash? So you do some what if analyses on your budget to understand your risk and what you need to do to, to mitigate that risk. And there's software out there. I'm not sure they pull on the same slide, but. but there's software out there so that each department can do their own budgets. It rolls it up into a single corporate budget um, that's then you know pushed down upon and you know, goes through an iterative process. Um, and they use the software, the software tends to support some of the else. Budgeting and services companies. Well, we don't have to worry about that um, annoying direct service budget. Right, it's, it's really labor driven and services company. So you're asking the question do we have enough staff to provide the expected level of service in the upcoming period? My experience is the way it works, let's say, in an accounting or a consulting firm, that you push for the growth in sales and you hold back on the growth in employees until you're sure that you've made that sales target. So you just make, because people are somewhat of a fungible resource, we can work more than 100%. Um, but what companies tend to do is they make sure that get to where they want to be with sales before you start hiring again. And most of the time people work harder when they when they're sure that it makes sense to grow, then they grow behind. So that's just the model in the real world that you, you, you don't want to grow staff and have to cut staff because you didn't meet targets. It's a little bit different in staff and service companies that we see in manufacturing. If you're planning to grow sales in manufacturing, you better buy the raw materials and produce the product, otherwise it's never going to happen. Some alternative um, budgeting approaches. Zero-based budgeting. It's the way all budgeting should be, and very rarely is it ever. Zero-based budgeting says, Forget about last year's budget. Forget about what we sold last period. Let's start at the ground floor and figure out what it's really going to cost. You know, this kind of thing is good, let's say, in service departments. 
in an IT department. Instead of saying, well, it cost us you know, $200 million to run IT last year, let's give ourselves 10% more. Go backwards and say, okay, what do we really need to run IT? And let's build from the bottom up. Here's the question. And so every activity, and this is your generally done in a bad economy, so every activity has to be justified. Why are we doing it? Is it worth the money? Difficult, time-consuming, expensive, annoying, um, but ultimately you you get to good answers if it's done thoughtfully. Activity-based budgeting is um, you know, comes from an ABC system, and you, you know, again it's a thoughtful process of going in at the detail level and understanding which activities need to happen, which ones don't happen, how can we improve the processes in terms of business process re-engineering um, focus to an activity-based budget. Okay. Behavioral issues in budgeting. How many of you have been involved in, I, I, I know at least one, how many of you have been involved in budgeting processes and stuff like that? Budgetary slack or padding the budget happens all the time. It'll happen as you work for if you work for an accounting firm and you're selling a project. You don't call it budgetary slack, you call it contingency. You want to have a little extra room, to, you know, if they're building a building, you know, they build contingency into the budget for the building building of the building. Not everything is always going to go right. But budgetary slack is the process of, on a bottom-down, a bottom-up budget, um, the individuals kind of making the budget work for what they want to accomplish rather than what's best for the organization. It has some advantages. It has the advantage of if the organization knows that the there's slack in the budget. And, but not too much, maybe five to ten percent, then the organization can really hold your feet to the fire and make sure you achieve the budget. You know, they let you have it, kind of thing. Kind of get what you want. On the other hand, if there's too much slack in the budget, you may not have to work as hard as you should be working to get things done. You may not have your goals aligned with the organizational goals at that point. Spending the budget. How many of you have ever been in a position where you spend the budget? <coughs> what month do you usually do that in? Yeah. December, right? <laughs> Definitely true. Because if you, if you kill your budget one year, what's going to happen the next year? It's going to make it that much harder on you. So you spend the budget to you know, try to save yourself from following the budget. Okay, goal con congruence, the degree of consistency between the goals of the firm, the subunits, and employees. The budgeting process, if done correctly, will create goal congruence. If it's done incorrectly, it will not. So you want to involve employees in the process, a, a participative budget. A top-down budget without participation from below will be ignored. Um, or you know, if it can't be ignored, it will be worked on but not with enthusiasm. So an easy budget with a lot of slack. Um, they fail to um, encourage budgets, but a too difficult budget um, can discourage employees. What you want is an achievable target with incentives. This leads to the question, should performance, should bonuses, should people be paid on how well they perform versus budget? Difficult question. On the one hand, it should be a part. It's what we needed you to do, and you either did it or you did what we'll pay you. But many of the items in the budget are outside of your control. And if you start incenting based on items outside of your control, then you're not going to create full confidence. But the employees just will score it up and say, I can't do anything about that. And so it's a process.
process. Um, you know, getting it right. You've all seen this word before. I've seen it so many different places. Kaizen, Japanese concept of continuous improvement in an organization. And so a Kaizen budget assumes continuous improvement. It assumes that you'll constantly get better, therefore the budget can get tighter and tighter over the course of the period. Some critics believe that budgets are effective for planning but not for control. What's the essence of this argument? Why would you say that budgets are good for planning but not for control? Controlling an organization, um, whether it's performance evaluation or you know, if, if, if an part of the organization did not meet their budget, taking corrective action to get that organization. Whereas for planning purposes, it makes sense to do um, as you try to plan for next year. Well, they're not designed to plan. They're not designed to plan. They are definitely designed to plan. Some organizations use them for control. There's no question. Um, if you work for an accounting firm, the department will be given sales budget. Sales budget, it may be reflected in the performance evaluation. It's not written into the budget. The budget is used as an input to the performance evaluation. Why is that budget used for control? Because it's used to control the employees. It's, right, you're trying to create full conflict between the employees and the organization. And so, if, if as a partner, who's a partner here? Okay. Igor is a partner at um, E1. Congratulations. Thank you. And he was given a million dollar budget this year <laughs> to sell. And he was going to make a million dollars if he sold 10 million. And he only sold 7 million, therefore the entire organization suffered. He doesn't get his million dollar bonus at the end of the year. He gets half of that. That would be how you use it. So they're forcing Igor to do everything in his power to sell that ten million. Sometimes that incentive sometimes that incentive works, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's fair, sometimes it's not. Um, and so some people say you should not use it for that. There are other ways to say what has Igor done the best possible job he can. So yeah. that's the argument. There's no question that it's effective planning we're looking forward there's definitely a question on whether you should use it as a performance evaluation okay this, this is a short breakout we're not going to have a lot of these um, breakouts for your teams today it's, this, this is not a topic that really leads to that but I'll give you a, a, why don't we take a 10 minute break here and just talk about the master budgeting process in your company um, what the key drivers are for budgeting this may be relevant. Those of you who are in the service industry, in particular, where you might be struggling to find theses, there may be something in here for you. I, I think the manufacturing companies, um, well, this is important manufacturing companies, you have a lot of other rich products on that same kind of mission. Service companies, if you're searching for a thesis, there may be something in here. Okay? So let's get back in just in 10 minutes. Thank you.